Welcome to the Ajvana Podcast, where we illuminate subjects in the IT infrastructure space. Get ready to hear some amazing insights from outstanding individuals that will change the way you think about IT. And now, here's your host, Mark Teeley. Hey folks, welcome to another edition of the Edgevana podcast. I'm Mark Teeley, your host, and joining me today is Andy Thry. Andy, welcome to the program. I'm glad we finally got you on. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. It's, I'm always glad to talk to you, even though we quite often talk um, not on camera with, uh, with our uh, colorful views, <laughs> but I'm glad to be on the podcast, on the mic, on the camera, you know, talking to folks. Uh, by the way, for people who don't know me, I am Andy Thurai, founder and principal at the Field CTO. I'm an independent analyst, thought leader, uh, concentrating on the AI, ML, AI ops, observability areas. You can find me on uh, Twitter at Andy Thurai and or on my website at thefieldcto.com. Awesome. And I, I, I highly recommend it, if, uh, especially for those of you who are, are looking at anything involving AI ops. Um, Andy has become uh, a leading authority in how to look at this um, uh, problem space for modern IT. So uh, welcome you to take to look him up and follow him on Twitter as well as he suggested. Tell me, Andy, you know, what can you tell me or what can you tell me about the GigaOM um, radar report for observability? I'm sure I'm certain you had a lot to do with that report. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Given that I worked on it for about uh, four plus months, yeah, I, I, and it's a fresh report, uh, fresh off the boat. So yeah, uh, it's become quite popular actually off late. So uh, for a few reasons. One, um, so it's not only it's a so it's a hot space, right? As you know. So when we set out, we actually, you know, I, I did quite a bit of research for a few weeks, and then uh, we looked at about twenty vendors, twenty plus vendors actually, right? 22-ish, I guess. Um, and then I thought about 16 of them are worthy of including in the report based on what was available publicly. And then I wanted a deep dive. Uh, because we didn't get uh, all the necessary information from two vendors, uh, I was bummed out. Actually, those were really good vendors. When we do an update, you will see that. Um, they were left out. But we published the report with, uh, with 14 vendors. For generally, for, uh, for the GigaOM radar report, 14 is on the little bit on the higher side, but um, but even with that, uh, by the way, this is one of the most crowded solution offering space right now, right? Since we published that report, even though we consider 20 plus, um, the report came out about two months ago, as you know, I was contacted by at least uh, 10 or so vendors complaining that they are not considered to be part of this report, wow. right? Wow. Um, so it's a, it's a hard space. I mean, I'm more than happy to discuss in more detail if you want, but I, you know, mindful of time, but uh, do you want to talk more about it on, on how we measure sure. the vendors? Give us, um, give us, like, if you had to give us, give an audience that might want to be interested or might be interested in the report, uh, you know, give them five points about, okay. um, about what makes the report um, important and what value they might get from it. Okay. All right. So when it comes to observability, we it's basically we measure on a few different metrics, right? On, on all the modern IT systems, obviously the the golden signals of the the metrics monitoring and the traces and the logs are very important. But but the way to achieve that doesn't have to be the the only way that they have to ingest all three uh, elements or golden signals or instrument for all of them, which is a monumental task in itself. At the end of the day, observability is about one thing, right? You got to find out as soon as possible when something goes wrong, where it went wrong, and what exactly went wrong. As long as you're able to figure that out, if there is a way you can get to it, we measure the vendors on those metrics. Uh, for example, you don't have to have a full-fledged enterprise centralized log management system which is not easy to implement, as you know. We all know logs are very expensive to produce, manage, maintain, transport, secure, store, and, and more importantly, search. So it's hard to make a meaning out of it if you have a ton of logs. You know, I mean, if I'm sure you have seen a couple of enterprise implementers, how much they struggle, right? Yep. So if you have another way to tell me when an incident happens, you get the score. So bottom line is we measure the vendors 
So I have a modern IT, I have a hybrid or a cloud native or a combination thereof. Something happens to my system. How fast can you tell me what happened? Where did it happen? What do I need to do to fix it? That's right. the bottom line. Right, makes sense. That makes sense, that's good. And, and folks, um, I've read a lot of what Andy puts together and, and this wasn't meant to be a sales pitch. Um, uh, the truth is, is that um, based on the work that I've been doing relative to Edge uh, and discussions that Andy and I have had uh, over the course of the last year, uh, I just feel like this is an important area of opportunity for education for all of us, as I think AI ops in general in the, in the modern space of distributed applications, microservices, and edge computing will become more and more critical to your ability to manage cost effectively and, and to de-risk um, your distributed environments. So anyway, that I'll, I'll get off that, um, that uh, soapbox now and, and get Thanks, on. Mark. I appreciate that. Stuff. I mean, maybe next time when I, when I go to promote something, I, I got to take you with me. There you go. Sounds good. <laughs> um, or just, you know, paint a big blue edge Vana on the side oh, of your car go. or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. More than happy so, to. So, you know, how does, how do, how do you see edge? I just mentioned edge, of course. And so now I'm going right into it. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see edge um, changing the observability angle? Oof. You don't waste any time, do you? <laughs> right into the hard stuff. <laughs> okay, let me think that for a second. Um, well, first of all, Edge is going to make things harder. L let me put it that way, simplistically, right? It, it, as it is, it's very hard to have a total observability. It, it's proven how difficult with the uh, to have the, the total observability with the distributed microservices. Look, it's very easy to monitor, observe, and manage the, the big monolithic application, right? But imagine a hybrid situation where you run a like a multi-microservices in all multi-cloud locations, use a bunch of APIs from other providers, and, and combine that with your own private data center. It becomes extremely hard to have a complete full stack observability all the time because right. you're all over the place, right? And yeah. this is the so-called core we're not even talking edge yet. So when yeah. you add edge devices to the mix, it become really distributed, I would say very fragmented. Matter of fact, those devices are less secure because obviously, you know, you don't have enough processing power or storage power. So you need to observe them more if there is any, right? So right. I, I don't even want to think about it. But all I can say is that we are still trying to solve a problem that is before that edge still. So it'll come. I mean, we would probably achieve total observability for edge in my lifetime, I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wouldn't necessarily say that's optimistic, but all right. Um, no, I, I mean, in, in all fairness, um, there are a lot of companies that are offering solutions in that space, right? All jokes aside, it is beginning to get integrated with the, with the, with the core. Uh, people are realizing that you know you, you got to have you got to have visibility into your edge devices. So there are a lot of solutions. The the having a full visibility of your edge devices is the most dif uh, difficult problem. Right. The the you know first of all the device is not secure. It may not allow you to update the software from outside, and then maybe it is hacked. So it's you don't even know what it's running, what variation it's running, uh, whether you do a proper fingerprinting. So. There are a lot of issues with edge and we haven't solved all of it, that's my point. Uh, right. We are still trying to solve a problem that comes with the core still. So yep. it's getting there. So, you know, and, and before we started, we were both talking a little bit about uh, a, a post that um, David Linthicum did on um, issues with uh, supporting edge, specifically around um, overhead of people in trying to support a distributed environment uh, and security. Um, and for those of you who are interested, uh, David Linthicum does some great stuff. And, and this article, I, I don't remember the URL, obviously, but the article is under David Linthicum. It's on InfoWorld. I think it was just published this morning or last night or something. Um, but, you know, from, from my perspective, I saw a lot that I agreed with. Um, I could probably argue with him a little bit about, um, uh, you know, being innovative relative to how to support distributed environments from a human perspective and from additional automation perspective, even from a, uh, depending on application design perspective, right? But um, do you see AI ops anytime in the near period providing some uh, 
at least improved visibility to reduce the overhead of having to be on site to look at hardware or, or look at component failure or things like that? Um, the simple answer is yes, right? <laughs> but but so get into the complexity. Of, by the way, I read his article as well, the InfoWorld article, that one particular yeah. point that he makes, which I completely agree with, um, the, the architects that are building uh, edge systems are building patterns that are very complex, less secure and harder to manage is, is, is what he is, you know, right, his right. thesis, which, which I agree. So I think we talked about, I think you and I had a podcast, uh, um, maybe last, late last year that we talked about this. Yep. So there's a major difference between the IT systems and the OT systems, right? Um, so IT being your, your infrastructure and, and IT systems, and OP, right. being, OT being your operational technologies, there's a, there's a divergence always. Uh, the problem is most times edge is not controlled by the core and it's not even managed by the IT. That's the reality of the problem, right? It's independent. And, and a lot of times they are even managed by some independent contractors. If you think about it, if you have to have the, the equivalent of, you know, somebody going and managing all these devices that geo diverse location, uh, it may not even be owned by your own corporation. I mean, uh, that's another um, angle that we talked about when I was at IBM. I even wrote a couple of pieces on that, um, <clears throat> that instead of owning every device and manage and operate, which becomes extremely difficult, you know, have someone else own it. And then all we worry about is the data that comes from that. Right. And, and so, I mean, edge is not easy. The security edge, at edge is difficult, obviously, because, you know, there's less processing power, less storage, the devices can be hacked, device fingerprinting is not easy, failed upgrade to roll back. There's so many things. But at the end of the day, there are two things that, that you have to do it properly. One is, you know, uh, as we talked about, as, as my, uh, my mentor, uh, my ex-boss from IBM, Mac Devine says, you got to move the value of data, not the volume of data. So just because you collect X amount of data from edge, that doesn't mean that you have to move all of it. So there is some processing, um, some storage maybe warranted at the edge. Um, there are even companies that are doing that, particularly when you do a ML models, that you could, you could get the data and then update the model uh, at the edge location itself, right. and then distribute the model itself instead of distributing the data, yeah. which could be even better, right? Yeah. So, so there are a lot of things you could do to reduce the risk uh, of edge deployments, but the, but the problem is there is the the edge architecture is not mature enough. I mean, look, we have had cloud for what now, 15, 20 years or even more, and yeah. still even that's not mature. So <laughs> edge is even fairly a newer concept. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take time, but right. yeah, I mean, it's, it's observability is improving, like I said earlier, right? Yeah. Um, get, take, what can, take what we can get at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, in, in line with that same discussion, um, mm -hmm. what do you see for, you know, real-time data and decision-making at the edge? And this is something we touched on in, in past conversations as well. Yep. Um, and, and it seems like there's value in that question from a number of angles, both for security of data, amount of data being retained, speed of responsiveness, and et cetera, et cetera. What's, so what's your take on that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of the about what you said, right? So one, um, the major key point that a lot of people fail to understand is that um, data loses value over time, all right? And you'd be surprised when you ask enterprises, how, what do you think your your value is? Just because you have a data, that doesn't mean that it will carry the same value across, you know, it'll be the same value now at real time, five seconds from now, five minutes from now, or, or you know, five days or five years from now, right? So it's, it's an interesting pattern that I'm observing with a lot of enterprises that everyone wants a real-time data and, and real-time decisions because of that, right? right? Once they've realized that the data is losing value. Yeah. Granted, data loses value rapidly, so everyone wants a real-time decision, but the, the edge processing gives you a, a leg up on processing that, right? Yep. But, the, but the problem I see, this is again, Andy's point of view, personal point of view, 
I tell the enterprises, you need to ask two questions, okay? One, is your architecture, your data processing capabilities are set up to handle a true real time, not claiming to be a real time, true real time. In other words, if, if some of your system that plugs into that are truly capable of only batch more processing or even just sampling because they couldn't handle the volume for that matter, how do you expect the real, true real time processing, right? right? So what's the point of even spending months of architecting, designing something and that you're not even capable of doing and spending a ton of money? So that you need to figure out first, which means you need to upgrade end to end of that pipeline, right? Yeah. Processing pipeline. And then the second thing I tell them, this is a question when I ask, they're like, eh, I don't know. I ask them, is a real-time decision really necessary? I mean, what are you trying to achieve? For example, let's say, you know, there was this customer that we were talking about and, you know, they were using uh, AI and vision-based systems to, to identify safety in a hazard zone. So what that means is that, you know, when you cordon of a zone as a safety zone, uh, either because of a chemical spill or, or because people have to wear a certain safety gear, you know, if, if somebody, if Andy walks in without wearing a safety gear or that, you know, if I'm allowed to enter that zone only from like say eight to five, and then I go at an hour that's odd hours, that need to be acted right away, like a real-time decision, right? Right. Or, or another example could be Uber's pricing model, right? I mean, if I'm at a location when I'm trying to call for Uber, it should be able to figure out, you know, where I am and who are the nearby drivers and what, how could we price? It's based on supply and demand, right? So they had to run, right. you'd be surprised how many models Uber creates and updates and pushes to the end and make a decision. You know, it's, it's mind boggling if, if you right. really get into the detail, right? right. Those are real-time decisions. But if you're talking about, you know, looking at someone's uh, uh, credit score, for example, or, or, you know, what is the need to update that on a per second basis or even someone's income calculation? Well, I wish right. my income changes on a <laughs> minute basis goes up, but, <laughs> you know, so it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes total sense. And, and it's, you know, at, at some point, I think, um, over the course of the next five years, uh, some people are going to make a lot of money in in uh, helping to provide strategy for data retention based on existing business model and use case. Yep. Um, uh, because I have to believe that there's an incredible opportunity in using the 80-20 rule. Yep. Um, especially if uh, you can use the 80-20 rule in conjunction with uh, whatever local compliance issues or sovereignty issues might apply. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what you see as the difference between observability, AI ops, and monitoring. Yeah, so, so I wrote a piece on this recently, right? Um, some of it is because uh, people are assuming things, and, and some of it is vendor created. I mean, there's obviously a lot of FUD out there, um, you know, trying to morph their solutions to create a sort of a more revenue channels, right? Old, old medicine, the new bottle, as I call it. So th that piece is published on Forbes. You could uh, either check it out on uh, in Forbes or or um, I, I, on Forbes or or uh, from my website, thefieldcity.com. There's a link to it. But right. but the bottom line is that you know so monitoring is is an old school way of measuring the metrics, right? Yeah. So you get the metrics uh, predominantly. You know something goes wrong when it goes wrong and and what goes wrong. But then monitoring, in a true sense, doesn't really tell you where it went wrong, especially when you have a distributed service. So when you have a, either a synthetic monitoring or RUM, it tells you something is wrong with your application as a whole application. And, and it won't tell you which microservice is affecting or which API is not returning properly. So that's one issue, right? And the other one is that also it won't tell you what exactly went wrong, right? If a microservice is faltering, is that because it's it's uh, it's done, it's not responding properly, it has a capacity problems, that a cloud service is running low, some of those things are not available. That's where observability come into picture, right? Yeah, so yeah. in my mind, monitoring is just a slice or piece of you know what you do. Yeah. And observability is, is total stack. Um, when I say total stack, I really mean the vertical stack all the way from your database to infrastructure to networking to, well, it should come the other way around, but, but um, you know all the way up to the app stack, yeah, yeah. You know, the entire stack, that's one. And then also give you an option to, uh, observe 
the the entire spectrum horizontally. For example, you know, no no obligation today. I mean, if if you still do it that way, that's pretty bad. It, it's coming from one application, one location. Your your composed of composite obligation probably has about 50, 60, or 100 services, microservices. Yeah. So your request travels from one to the other. So when you do that, you can just measure saying that, okay, did this one perform? You need to know the entire trace of, right? You don't have to actually get the trace from each of that, but at least you got to know what's happening. So the, the total observability goes in that sense, a uh, horizontal of, you know, entire spectrum. Yeah. And then the vertical spectrum, plus on top of it, you, you should be able to do hybrid locations or multi-cloud locations as well, not just uh, one cloud or one uh, data center, right? Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, oh, by the way, the, the, you asked about AI apps as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so AI apps is, is uh, you need observ observability is more about the, the signals collection, as right. I would say, the golden signals collection. And AI apps is the one technically, even though AI apps I consider to be part of the total observability, but most people don't. So yeah. You need a complete observability to feed into AI ops. AI ops is what gives you insight. So that's how people are differentiating now, right? Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. And I appreciate the breakdown um, uh, uh, for all three categories. So that's good. Um, so why do you think um, when you you know when you consider the the uh, you even hinted at it earlier uh, how many companies you didn't get in the report. And yet you already had a lot of companies in the report. Um, why do you think it's so hard for um, enterprises to get the kind of um, uh, control of IT and cloud operations that they need or that they deserve? Um, can I phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's ugh, that's a tough question. So um, look, so there are when I classify the enterprise companies. So or okay, let's talk about enterprise companies. The classic sense of what an enterprise company also changes. In the past, we used to say enterprise companies are measured by the number of employees. If they had like a, what employed two hundred thousand people or more, they, they are legacy companies. Or if they make a revenue of hundred million or more, they are legacy com. I mean. A, enterprises or legacies or whatever you call it. Yep. But now, if you look at it, it, it's in the database economy, it's more of what kind of volume of data you produce. Do you think any of those legacy companies do even 10%, no offense, of the volume what Uber or Lyft does, right. or even Airbnb does, or Yelp does, or any, any of those digital native companies does? So, right. so your defining of enterprise in the digital native world is totally different, right? right. And the interesting factor I observe with the digital native, cloud native companies is a lot of them don't think the existing legacy or observability, legacy observability, legacy monitoring tools doesn't work for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For a good reason. So the it, because it can be truly really observed or monitored by legacy solutions because it a it may or may not provide the monitoring and observability that you're looking for B it might be too exp expensive. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Prometheus has become a, a de facto standard for, for Kubernetes container-based uh, workloads for, for metrics monitoring, okay? Right. Developers yeah. and DevOps teams love it, love it because it's free, cheap. You can't beat that, right? So, yep. but ops teams, not so much because it's not part of their existing ecosystem, right? Uh, first, you have to take that. It's already built by them. Either you try to convert them into, because uh, you can ask any ops teams guys, they'll tell you then how difficult it is to productionize the Prometheus. So that's yeah. why if you, if you Google it, you will see it. There are at least about four or five companies. One of them I'm advising uh, has uh, come up with the Prometheus as a service. Even uh, AWS recently announced that, right? Yep. It's not easy to productionize what developers love, which is free and cheap. Right. But that comes instrumented with your cloud native when you build it. So the ops teams have a problem right now. Can I, I have an existing solution, whatever that may be, one of the legacy solutions, right? 
can I take this and somehow try to fit that into my system so it will work? Because I know my compliance, my security, my auditing, my identity management systems, my policy-based enforcement, all of the thing is built in here. But yep. this thing, what's coming in here, it's not. So can I, Primithi is just one example. There are, you know, log D and, you know, there are a bunch of other fluent D and a bunch of other things I can talk about, right? But can I take all of this open source C solutions and fit them into my model? Right existing model and make the legacy things monitor that? Or can I just figure out a way to build the entire thing that's based on this? So to answer your, your short question in a long-winded way, most of the digital na native companies have figured out how to operationalize that. Right. So that's why if you look at a lot of those digital native companies, Uber, Lyft, and you know, even LinkedIn for that matter, that's one that built Kafka, right? Yep. They all build some sort of a solution that will work for them because the scale, the digital scale is almost impossible for the legacy tools to provide. Right. Plus, even if they provide the cost model could be very prohibitive. So some of these companies build it themselves so they don't even care. So right. they, they, I just built it, it'll work and it truly, it works. And yeah. then obviously there are kinks to it. That's why there are problems. Sometimes you you see in the, on the on the um, magazines on the net, but then they solve it as they go along. Right. And and if you are to use a legacy, you got to figure out a way to fit that. So there's a there's a constant struggle right now, and and it could go either way. But there are there are varying architectures or, or standards that people are doing. Some are trying to fit this into that. Some are trying to build it by themselves it's, it's, it's maturing. It's yeah, maturing. Yeah. No, and it's, um, it's interesting too. I mean, it's, uh, this is a little bit uh, peripheral to the conversation, Andy, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, I think topical because it applies to the greater discussion of, um, you know, to have, um, everything to the assumption that everything will be in public cloud versus on premises et cetera, et cetera, is that in a digital company, when they make a decision about building their own or buying, they, they have to, if, if they've done it before or if they have any thought process at all about cost of operations, they, the first question they're gonna ask any vendor, and if you haven't heard this before, then listen up, because this is one of the first questions they will ask you, is will I get penalized for my growth? Yes. Right? LinkedIn would pay $20 million for the right solution. But if they know that it's going to go up 15 or 20% a year because that's their growth curve, then they're not going to buy it. They're going to say, well, it'll cost me $25 million to build it. But at least after I'm done building it, I won't have to pay. You another nailed it. Year. You nailed it. This okay. is the thing that most of the companies are struggling with. especially. Okay. But cloud made the playing field even for everybody. Yep. You don't have to be looking for the big behemoths to offer a certain solution. You could go to a multi, small, small tiny 10 people company, which provides probably a better solution than a big enterprise would, right? But all of these guys are on the growth curve, as you're saying. So if I'm whatever company, you know, food delivery service, taxi service, you know, whatever as a service I'm offering, I don't know what my growth curve is going to be. And I want to use you. Yes, I love it. If I'm going to be, I don't have time to worry about, you know, your whatever you're giving me is going to offer a solution. So it's funny you you mentioned that. So can I, so, okay, so I, I, I will tell you something, but no names mentioned, right? right. Okay, so so I, I was talking to this was large enterprise customer, right? Was it George? Huh? Was it Steve? Was it George? Was it a car? <laughs> all, all of the above, right? <laughs> okay. So, Checking. so, um, I, who shall remain faceless, right? Um, yeah. um, so, or are nameless. Um, so I was talking to this large enterprise customer and, and I asked them, so how much of your, not, not the legacy production systems, but the new cloud-based digital systems do you monitor, right? Yep. The answer actually truly shocked me. You wanna take a guess? At least in this particular case, it may be different. How much do you think generally people monitor the production systems? I'm not talking about a hot backups. I'm not talking about a pre-prod. I'm not talking about a dev test systems. I'm talking about a real live production revenue producing live production systems in cloud. 
how much like as a percentage of what they're running do they monitor of total yeah. monitorable um uh, uh point how much of the yeah. systems are totally observable in other words if it goes down that i'll know what to do with that oh god i would say probably 20 percent uh, okay so you're you're more conservative but uh yeah it's it's between 20 and 50 yeah right? it's way less than half right and we are talking about a production systems, the systems that are live, that's bringing yeah. in revenue. In other words, your business depends on it. I mean, now yeah. business depends on IT. So yeah. you depend on this. If this goes down, you go down. If this portion goes down, your business goes down, right? Not your IT, your right. business goes down. You can't call for taxi. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on Uber. That's a great right. company, great service. But imagine if their IT goes down, Stand still, your business is done, right. right? I'm not saying they are, but you know, when that way they operate, but only about 30% of your systems you monitor, the rest of them, you know, you, you just wing it. And, 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 um, and the reason is like you said, one is obviously cost. Yeah. He said, if I have to monitor all of my systems using this legacy tool that we chose, we'll go broke in no time. The scalability is an issue for them, not right. from an architecture point, from a cost point, right? And the other one is, it's very hard to implement because the way they are implementing the systems in a hybrid cloud, particularly right. with multi-services and APIs all over the place, yeah. right? So they basically just take a chance operating blindly. There's yeah. a reason some companies take a hit quite often than others. So if you watch closely, you'll know who they are. Yeah, isn't right? it isn't it true that um, I mean I agree, and uh, so isn't it true that a big part of the problem um, could be related to a problem that people that have worried about security in their company uh, could probably relate to easily enough, and that's that it's one thing to observe everything, mm -hmm. it's another it's another thing to understand correlation, right? And so. If you observe everything and you get 5,000 points of reference every hour or every day, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, it does make a difference, but either way, it's a lot. Um, so you get 5,000 points of reference a day. What you need is something that helps you understand of those 5,000 points, which 10 are indicative, indicative of failures that are about to cause you real headaches and which 10 are indicative of risks that are gonna come tomorrow and which hundred are indicative of risks that are just slowing performance for some or all of your customers somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. And isn't that piece of the puzzle one of the hardest parts of successfully monitoring and actually leveraging that monitoring? You know what? Maybe we should just delete the entire podcast, replay your that last one minute, we'll call it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the key, right? Yeah. Because what happens is when I go to enterprises, I, I, as you know, I also consult and advise with the C-level on how to do this properly. And, and when I talk to them, everybody seemed to think, at least right now, they are more worried about instrumentation and collection of data or, or operational metrics. They're like, yeah. oh, you know, I'm not measuring that. Okay, so what is your end goal? Let's work backwards. So you are trying to achieve a zero MTTR. So you collect from five more places, like you said, what are you gonna do with that? You, you, gotta, you gotta do something with that. So going back to the report, I, I don't wanna endorse any specific vendor, but there are some vendors in there, not only will, will tell you, you don't have to go through, uh, some vendors obviously are to go to the system, see what happened, that system to figure it out and that system. So. Your, your time to, so obviously we talked about this last time and MTTR consists of two pieces, right? One is MTTI, mean time to identification. The second one is how do you resolve? This yeah. is somewhat fixed because you have mature processes in place, you have run books in place, you have operational process in place. So if you know what the problem is, this is fixed. Yeah. This is the variable to figure it out, right? So you want this to be zero, as zero as possible to make things happen. And the goal should be that, make it to zero. Yeah. If yeah. you can't figure out a way to make that to zero or close enough to it, what's the point of collecting metrics from two, three more or 300 different places? Right. You should be able to get insights from it. That's the goal of observability. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I obviously I agree or I wouldn't have brought up the point. So right. thank you for the additional um, clarification because- No worries. I, I, um, I 
thought about it because uh, one of the first times um, I was putting in serious monitoring for as many aspects of the network uh, that I could from a security standpoint, um, I was asked a, a stupid question by my boss. I thought it was stupid. He goes, so what are you going to do now that you actually see all the red lights that are occurring in the network? Uh -huh. And uh, my quick answer was, well, what do you mean? I'll respond to him. <laughs> and he goes, well, okay. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I used 5,000 as a specific reference. Mm. The gentleman that was working with me at the time was uh, John Tobias. Mm. And um, he was my, my main security guy in infrastructure. Mm. And uh, sure enough, we got about 5,000 references the first wow. day. Wow. First day. And um, there was no way we were going to look at all of them. And even looking at a percentage of them, basically what we, I was worried about happening would be that, you know, two months later, we would just ignore all of it. Hmm. Now we expect, that, so yeah. that's, that's the, um, what is it, uh, the syndrome they call it? Um, the uh, crying wolf or, or yeah. 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 So, so it's, that's what happens if you uh, actually, I, I, again, I, it keeps coming across as if I'm, I'm keep self-promoting, but I wrote a piece on that saying how the alert fatigue is the one that's going to kill your ops teams because right. it's, you could put all the systems in place. You could make all the notifications, all the alerts. Well, what's, what, what are you doing with that? I mean, you're going to confuse your teams, giving contradicting information, right? Yeah. And, and create a lot of alerts and then that'll create a fatigue on them. They, they don't even know what the hell they're chasing. They're chasing their own tail at times and they're going in circles without knowing what they're doing. So it got to be uh, the true measure, as, as you yourself said earlier, of an observability system and a combination of monitoring observability uh, and AI ops system. I don't care what you call it, but that combination of that at the end of the day, when something goes wrong, you tell me what went wrong, how do I fix it? Right. Done. And then I could have it up and running in no time. That's all I need to know. That's right. the bottom line, right? It makes sense. Makes sense. So, Andy, uh, we've we've already run longer than uh, I normally run these podcasts, but um, I want to ask you one more question, if you don't mind, before we wrap up. Sure. You know, in the space of um, AI ops and observability, mm -hmm. what do you see? Or you know, in the in the IT spaces that they are um, meant to help solve problems in, um, what do you see as the next frontier? That's a good ending question, right? The uh, actually the the point we just touched on a little earlier, the yeah. the IT automation, right? Right now, the infrastructure portion is somewhat automated, right? For example, the capacity planning, scalability, blah, and all that, right? Uh, because it's infrastructure as a code. But ultimately, where I think it's going, and a lot of people are doing this already, infusing AI and ML. It's about forcing event events, predicting events. For example, if if Amazon region takes a hit, people think that it doesn't, but it's quite often region wise there are hits. You know, then your entire load, if you're running in one region, it could go down. Are you able to are you able to predict what's going to happen because of some events? What do you see, and then figure out what incident is happening and automate to make sure that my system, uh, how should I put this? Because people use this word in the wrong sense. Can I build a truly self-healing application, right? Right. In other words, my system have to be up and running all the time, regardless of where. If, if that cloud goes down, one region goes down, have it up and running in a different region. If, if a cloud itself goes down, have it running in a different cloud, a separate cloud, because so many cloud providers have it in the same region, the region wise, they are not much different. So yeah. spin off in a different region, run it, run in a hybrid, doesn't matter where you run, it's all operational details. At the end of the day, your uh, your business will be up when your IT is up. How do you get there? A true 99 point, whatever, the four, five, nines uptime. Yeah. That's the bottom line, yeah. right? Makes sense. So. Well, Andy, this has been fantastic. And and thank you again for, for joining us today. Um, I hope uh, the audience will take something away from this uh, that can help them. Um, you know, I, I some of the points you made about um, you know observability versus AI ops versus monitoring, combining them, um, the fact that there are companies doing amazing things in this space, uh, and uh, kind of to top it all off, this last part of the conversation we've been having about um, 
uh, trying to find the right way to um, find resolution for problems that are actually worth resolving versus just being notified of everything, right? Um, right. And, I, and I think that uh, for every overworked IT team um, uh, that I've been a part of, uh, that's uh, a key to success because otherwise, uh, I mean, there, there were too many nights when I went home thinking I'm a failure. Didn't matter that I just worked 12 hours. I'm a failure because I know that I don't have automatic BIOS updates uh, on all my hardware. I know that uh, I don't know. This is a stupid answer or stupid comment, but I knew that I didn't know everything that was going on in my environment, right? And those are the kinds of things that any, any reasonable head of ops or infrastructure should be wondering about when they go to bed at night. The funniest thing is, I don't know how many years before you are referring that to, I don't want to, you know, date yourself and, and make you feel old, but that's, that's not different now. It's much worse now, right? And, yeah. and every time when I talk to an enterprise guy, all they say is this, I'm, I'm worried about one thing. One, the, the other thing is also, again, I, I know we are over time, but one quick point I want to make a lot of these enterprise companies, some of them truly want to have their IT up and running all the time, the true noble goal. Some of them are worried about, you know, more of a risk mitigation. In other words, if something were to go wrong, I don't want to get sued. I don't want my name to get spoiled. I don't want to be the next headline. They are operating in that mode. If that's the mode you're operating in, you're never going to achieve this. So you got to start with your goal and what you're trying to do and then work backwards. Yeah. And and if not, well, you know, get your resume ready. <laughs> you know? Makes sense. Makes sense. So Andy, um, before we wrap up, uh, remind everybody again, the best places to find you and your work. First of all, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I, I mean, thank I've been you. listening to your podcast quite a while. You had some big names talking about big topics. I'm truly honored to be on your podcast. Oh, no, well deserved, <laughs> well deserved appreciate that and uh, so yeah obviously you you could find me on my website where i uh, yap my thoughts at uh, thefieldcto.com again that's thefieldcto.com or you can connect with me on linkedin and i'm on twitter also at andy Therai. again thank you so much no thank you and um, appreciate you being on the show and um, can't wait to see this come out Thank you for listening to the Edgevana podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app or on YouTube. To learn more, visit www.edgevana.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us on our next episode.